Hey. Hey there, hi there, ho there. <laughs> Howdy doody. <clears throat> hey, my turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of astronomy edutainment, the Sunday night astronomy show. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> New guests get embarrassed, eh? But oh well. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I'm now very pleased to introduce my two co-hosts this evening, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshot Observatory in beautiful Hampton. Paul, good evening. Good evening, everybody. And our other co-host, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John. Mike. Good evening. And we'd also like to welcome all of you uh, who are joining us through the uh, local Rogers TV network and of course, on YouTube and Facebook as well. Uh, thank you very much for your, all your support. Now, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, now, learning about the night skies can be a challenging and rewarding experience. And as astronomers, each of us follows a different path. And it's because of this that we can learn from each other and ultimately making the hobby and uh, understanding our place in the universe uh, easier. Now, it is to that end that we changed our format on the program to, uh, to help you, um, to help introduce you to others in the hobby whose experiences may be different than our own. Now, tonight we'll introduce another local astronomer, Mike Thorne. Um, Mike has become an active member in our local outreach uh, efforts and enjoys setting up his equipment with us at our local favorite spot here in St. John, St. Rest Beach. Uh, tonight we'll have a little chat with Mike and learn about uh, his, uh, his journey and, and how he's progressed through the hobby. Uh, we'll also have our uh, regular segments and ask an amateur. Paul's going to bring that one for us. Um, the celestial event of the week, which I'll be doing, and uh, a new product of the week, which I'll also be doing this week, uh, along with another Bono Bud target. And uh, always, as always, an interesting Rosanna's Fun Fact segment. I'll also be reminding everybody about our current Shoot the Moon contest. I've got some entries, uh, about a dozen or so, so far. I haven't checked my email today, so hopefully there's a few more in there. Um, and we're waiting for my kids' entries to arrive, which I expect they'll start coming next week when the kids get back to school. So <laughs> forward to those. Anyway, um, and we'll have all of your wonderful photo submissions here, of course, as well. So this is a live interactive broadcast. So put your comments up there and questions, and we'd be happy to try and answer them if we can. So first up this evening, a conversation with our friend, friend and fellow astronomer, Mr. Mike Thorne. Good evening, Mike. Good evening. How, How you are doing? you? Good, you? I'm doing good. Good to hear. How's the how's weather out your way? Cloudy. <laughs> We've never been down that road before. No, no. First ever. Um, so, Mike, tell us a little bit about how you get started in hobby. Well, I was out with the dogs every night. And one night I seen a bright light in the sky. Didn't move. Didn't. It was just always in the same place for the most part. And night after night, I kept seeing it and seeing it. I'm like, what is it? It's got to be something. So I figured I'll try to Google it. But I didn't want to end up learning how to make tinfoil hats and whatnot. So I <laughs> thought about how to Google it to get reliable information. And one of the sites that came up was the St. John Astronomy Club. And I'm like, well, it's local. Seems like it could have credible information. And um, when I clicked on it, it went into one of Kurt Nason's weekly sky reports. And it mentioned how Venus was so bright in the west-northwest sky. And I'm like, well, that's got to be what it is. And so then from there, I just kept looking around and looking around. And I wanted to learn more and more. Hmm. I was always fascinated by the sky. And you've got a, you've got a dark location, too, as well, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm on the backside of Hampton, so. Yeah, yeah, so that, that helps a lot, for sure. So uh, where are you at now? Like, what are you using for equipment? I um, My first scope was a four-inch, and it did gave really good views of the moon and the planets, but I wanted more. Hmm. And I found the manual tracking was frustrating, so I upgraded to a eight inch evolution okay yeah and i just that's love jump. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big jump <laughs> well i doubled my yeah. power yeah well size you're happy with it oh very happy yeah excellent working scope yeah yeah they are they, they uh 
they're like they're lighter than the average like these the regular c8s i know and uh they track they seem to track better the battery seems to last uh, you don't have to worry about battery i guess they've got internal battery right yeah it's got the built-in one yeah yeah so a lot of improvements they've made with celestron over the years <clears throat> and it's got the clutches if you run out of battery it... uh, <clears throat> yeah you're not completely... definitely an advantage to those mounts is that you can use the manual clutches and still move it around if you have no power mm. so mike has joined us at saints rest beach a number of times we've been down there um Mike was set up beside me at the Irving Nature Park. There you go, Joey. <laughs> Joey Craswell. Hey, Joey. Um, so, yeah, uh, Mike's been down there with us a number of times. And uh, it is a great location, really, to, to set up. Like, we've been, uh, the three of us, I think, have been been there a few times uh, um, set up. And uh, it's one of the better locations within the city limits, I would say, uh, to set up. You know, you wouldn't think that you'd have that dark of a sky in that area, but... Uh, with St. John Energy uh, doing their LED lighting retrofit and putting their full cutoff uh, shades on. Uh, even when you fly over the city now, it looks fairly dark, a lot darker than it did uh, like just a few years ago. And so from there, you get, a, you get a pretty nice Milky Way. You can capture a nice Milky Way even with with, with images, right? But uh, but it's just, I mean, sitting there, watching the moon, listening to the waves is you know, pretty good. And you're only, you know, 10 or 15 minutes from home. For your case, Mike, of course, you know, a lot longer. but. Um, <laughs> have to kind of make a commitment to come to town. So Mike has, has emailed me once in a while or Facebook Messenger. And, Are you guys heading to the beach tonight? <laughs> because I got to make a commitment whether I'm coming or not. <laughs> yeah. And then we get there. It is go. impressive how it has such a good sky for being in the city. Yeah. I had to laugh that night. We went down there and we're, we got our phones out trying to figure out which way, you know, What's what's east and we're 70 degrees and everybody's got their phones out and everybody's phone's showing a different direction. Mike pulls out a compass. Yeah. <laughs> drops it on drops it on the fence post and goes, right there, it should come up in between the red house and the post. <laughs> like, right. And everybody's phone was showing a different direction. The plain old compass was bang on. <laughs> Sometimes you can't beat low tech. Exactly. <laughs> That's right up my alley. <laughs> You mentioned the manual mount earlier, and I mean they are they are frustrating, you know, awfully. Uh, they're great maybe to to learn a few things in the sky, uh, learn where things are. Um, that might help a bit, but that like say stepping up to a an, an evolution is a is a big step, and it's a lot more convenient because it's what do you want to do when you're out there? Are you are you looking to learn the sky or are you looking to look at objects, right? And sometimes you're you're you know, you may be you may be looking at both, maybe trying to decide. I want to know where something is in the sky. You know, manual mount's great for that, but if you want to really spend some time looking at that particular object, you have to have a go-to or uh, something that tracks, right? Well, I found with the manual that just to get change eyepiece from the time you pick up another eyepiece to put it in, you have to try to find your object again. Mm. Chase it and chase it and chase it. Yeah. I just thought it's kind of frustrating. If I get too frustrated, I'm not going to keep at it. Yeah. You know, I think I'm going to. The one thing in that statement that you just made, Mike, about having to chase it is one thing that um, you'll learn um, if you've got an equatorial mount is that everything moves in right ascension. So the, the one thing that people who don't have a lot of experience with telescopes do is they'll actually start moving their declination and their right ascension, and then you can never find a darn thing again. But if all you do is just, if you lost your object, and if you've got it set up right, and you did your polar alignment and all that, then if you lost your object, all you have to just do is just keep moving it in right ascension, you'll come right onto it again. Because that's the only place that it moves if you're polar aligned. And, uh, and it's interesting that you brought that point up, because when you're using um, an alt as mount, it's a different story. Than, uh, than if you're using a German equatorial mount. So um, so uh, to make that switch over to a full go-to mount, if, if, if you were being frustrated by that, that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and the other thing that, because uh, I have an evolution as well, mine's just a little six inch one, but the neat thing about it is um, even if you don't know the sky, you can use that to learn the sky. So rather than just saying, okay, there's my object, well, wasn't that cool? And if, if you don't bother looking up in the sky to see where it is, then you won't learn anything in terms of mapping of the sky. 
But if you let your go-to mount go find the target for you, then have a look around it and see what constellation it's actually sitting in and that kind of stuff, then a go-to mount can be used very effectively uh, for learning the night sky. So yeah. was that kind of your experience with it at all or? Yes. Because I found the less fighting you're doing, the more interesting it is. Yeah, is makes sense. 20 minutes of fighting, just why am I doing this? And then I got the go-to and I can slew and it's just much more convenient. And if it's convenient, you'll keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, so true. And the, yeah, the more the more magnification you use as well, the faster things are moving through your IP. So you've got to follow, like you want to get that nice big view of Saturn and the rings and all of a sudden it's there and it's gone, you know, and you, you don't have time even with the moon, even to capture it, you know, to take a photo of it if you wanted to, right? If uh, it's moved so quickly through your IP. So I used to do a lot of uh, live feeds with the dog down at the beach. And uh, that's what I was doing, you know, continuously tracking, you know, and you'd let it set and it wouldn't be any more than five seconds if it's gone over the IP. So mm -hmm. especially with magnification, but. Yeah. What, so what, what, what kind of eyepieces are you, are you using on your, like, do you have a favorite eyepiece that you like to use on your scope? I usually use the 40 and <laughs> yeah. the 824 zoom. Yeah. And they're about my main go-tos. Yeah. If I want power, I got a five. Uh, I rarely use that. And 32. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Mike, Mike's always, Mike Powell has always talked about how um, he enjoys the wide angle, the wide views. And like it took me a while to get into that. But once I started looking at them, I was like, oh, now I see why. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you more perspective. Yeah. I, I learned something new this week about the evolution mounts. If you have some batteries that go bad, Clear Power Solutions will apparently replace them for you at a very reasonable price. And they do a heck of a good job from what I gather. Would they Rob did that come from Rob? Yeah. Because my battery went bad too. And Rob told me the last when I was out at Fun Dave, our last time I was out with you guys. Yeah. My battery went south and so did his. Yeah. He so got his down to clear power and he said they did a great job and it's beautiful. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take mine in. Um, yeah, because if you don't use those evolution batteries all the time, they'll just <clears throat> so you've got to yeah. keep you gotta keep the charging them, use them, charge them, use them, or they're gonna Go south on you. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, yes, a, that's very good to know. Thank you. <laughs> just a little tidbit you pick up, you know, read messages and stuff, because Rob and I were discussing it. And we had mentioned that they have that battery place here in the city. And sure enough, he went down there and he said they did a phenomenal job yeah. and they changed it out for him. So did it take long, you know? Uh I didn't, I don't know. It, I'll, it really I'll, shouldn't. I'll, It'd probably leave it overnight and have it done by the next day. I was gonna say I'll, I'll shoot him a message and find out, but uh that would be so worthwhile to have yeah. done. And then I wonder how how big a job it is, because it wasn't that big a job just to get a spare one to have on your own and just change it again. Because oh, over time, I'm sure you have to do it again, right? I'm sure you could. You know, you just wrap it in some kind of a you know shrink wrap or something so it stays together. It's just a bunch of lithium ion batteries you know soldered together to give you 12 volts. Oh, okay. So anyway, I didn't want to cut in there. It was just no, no. That's good to know. Because we're all interested in that. <laughs> well, <laughs> tidbits of information that you come across because you know you mentioned the evolution mount, and I've always loved the evolution mount. It's such a big step over the SE mounts mm. because you do have the clutches and you do have the Wi-Fi and you do have you know everything built into one mount, which makes it so easy. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's nice. It's well. What's nice about it is you take the whole thing. If you want to even leave the scope on the mount. You take the whole thing, fold the legs up, and just kind of put it in the back seat, yeah. stand it up, and away you go. Like there's no battery hookup, there's nothing. It's just so it's all self-contained. Yeah. So I'm just I'm kind of curious, Mike, why why you would pick an evolution eight inch with a two thousand millimeter focal length over something like a an eighty millimeter refractor or a ninety millimeter refractor with say a, a seven hundred millimeter focal length. Were you looking to cover planets more or less than say, deep sky uh, nebula or stuff like that? I just wanted something big. So <laughs> simply the use. <laughs> that answers it. That answers it. Really. That's, that's, that's the real man answer right that, there. That works for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's funny, but we all do when we first get in the hobby. I remember, um, I think I told the story once before, but um, I wanted to, uh, I just got in, I was all excited. I bought that scope I bought from you, Mike, that little um, 650, 150 uh, yeah. Skywatcher uh, Newtonian. And uh, I called up KW. I said, I'm going to get take pictures and I want the biggest scope you got. <laughs> <laughs> he talked me right out of it. So <laughs> we could. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Everybody goes out and starts off, you know, get that big piece of glass. And then eventually, for some reason, if they get it, especially if you get into astrophotography, you step down to oh, the yeah. smaller pieces, right? <laughs> but for viewing, yeah. And, and, you know, the 8 inch Picasso grain is a good all around scope for, for just about everything. Yeah. yeah. 40 millimeter and an 8 inch is, is good. Yeah. Lots of lots. I mean, you can get the whole moon. You can just get the moon, <laughs> but you can get the whole moon in the shot. And then, of course, when you want to pump it up for planet, uh, Planet viewing is there for that as well, yeah. right? Yeah, lots of light gathered. Well, that's what you're saying, Mike, about your um your twenty your eight to twenty four. I'm assuming is what your zoom lens is. Yes. So that must be your your go to for your moon, is it? Um, no, forty, forty in the thirty two. Yeah. Unless but, I really want to go in on the craters, then I'll use the zoom. Right. Yeah, because you go to what twenty four on that. That still would be actually quite uh, narrow. For yeah, it is. Telescope, isn't it? Quite a close view at 24. So what do oh, you yeah. get half the moon in it? I'm not really sure. I haven't looked at yeah. the moon in a while. Yeah. Through It'd the be zoom lens, I've mainly <laughs> just... <clears throat> excuse me. The last few times I've had the scope out was for outreach, and I used the 40 for a full view. Yeah. yeah. Um, on mine, I've got the six inch version of the same scope you do. And um, I use the 24, eight to 24, and I can just get the full moon in um, on the uh, 24, but I'm, I'm only 1600 millimeters. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're 2023 or something. So, yeah, so you probably won't get it in with your. Um, no. Or, yeah. I yeah. think I can just fit the full disc in with the 32. Yeah. Barely, yeah. Okay, mm. yeah, yeah. Did you do you have a reducer, Mike? Did you ever think about getting a reducer for your scope? I was thinking about that. I'm kind of up in the air between getting a focal reducer or upgrading to two inch eyepieces. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're just using one and a quarter now. Mm. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, definitely a difference going from a two inch and a quarter to a two inch. So I always equate it to a porthole to a picture window. <laughs> yeah, when you get into like 68 or 72 degree field of view, or like I know the uh, the other ones with 100 field of view, like, it's just like you're looking through a, a, a great yeah. big one. It, it was awful. But, and I mean, the, the evolution would take those easily as far oh, as weight. Yeah, absolutely. Now, are the evolutions, are they fast arc compatible as well? I yes. assuming they would be. Yeah, they are. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't mention it anywhere in the description, and I was surprised when I actually had it. I looked at the front, and I'm like, that one screw can take fast start. But yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a nice option to have. It's a little on the expensive side, but it's a nice option to have, for sure. Yeah, well, the, the thing about it is that typically, if you use the fast start, then you don't have to bother um, with guiding. Because yeah. you can you can take most of your shots shots sorry within about thirty seconds. So if you're shooting really well, then um, uh, thirty seconds you can get a lot of a lot of data, especially where you live, Mike, where your mm. sky is so dark. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, guys, we're going to pause here for a minute. We're going to come back and talk to Mike again because we want to keep continue the conversation, and uh, I want we want to get to some other uh, segments that we have here as well. But I did have a request here. Hang on a second. Uh, Diane says, Chris, I uh, love your T-shirt. Bob Ross and Galaxy's Epic. Tell us about it. Okay, well, here we go. There it is. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> my, <laughs> my favorite painter with my favorite galaxy. There you go. <laughs> it comes, it's the pot belly galaxy. That's the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, I got that at uh, I think it was the store at McAllister Place, and I've had it for a couple of years. And I got out of the closet the other day. He said, hey, I forgot about that shirt. So, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, you just add a little dash of little dash of white there and that's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Got yourself a galaxy. It's a, <laughs> a fun galaxy right there. Oh, that's hilarious. 
Um, <laughs> let's go uh, from there to, uh, I guess we're going to go to Ask an Amateur, Paul. Oh, okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, this this week, I'm just going to stay uh, live. I'm going to show you, I'm going to just turn off my background so you can see what I want to show you. And we had a question come in um, from Bill Johnson. And Bill was asking, he says, every time I go out and do a, a view with my binoculars, I just can't seem to get a really clear picture or a clear view of what's going on. And uh, so um, so I thought I would do a universal answer to that. Um, but it, can you make my screen, Chris, bigger or do I just do it myself? A second here. Um, I'm just going to change the view here to speaker. There we go. Okay. All right. And I'm just going to turn uh, my background off. Just give me one sec here. Choose virtual background. None. There we go. Okay. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to turn on my house lights just so you can see this better, because this is kind of an important thing to go through. It won't take any more than a couple of minutes, but. So, so my answer to Bill would be simply, um, most people, when they get binoculars, just think you take them right out of the box, put them up to your eyes and you can see. And in, in most cases, that's probably true in most cases. But there are some cases where people have uh, uh, trouble or a situation where one eye doesn't focus quite the same as the other. And if that's the case, then uh, the binoculars do have an adjustment for that. So to set binoculars up, <coughs> excuse me, uh, initially, then you just get your binoculars up in front of you, just like so. Let's get my camera so you can see them better. There we go. Just like so. And then what you're going to do first, if I put them this way, you can probably see this even better, actually. You're going to take your binoculars. Oops. There we go. You're going to get behind them. And I'll take my caps off so you look like I'm actually looking at something. And you're going to take and put your eyes to them. And then you're going to take the barrels like this, and you're going to move them up and down until you get one circle that you're looking through because what's happening is you're trying to line up the both pupils with um, the eyepieces in the back. So when you look in them, you want your pupils in the center of the glass. And they make that because everybody's eyes are spread apart a little different than say everybody else's. So you have to find that sweet spot so that you get those pupils looking right directly in the center of, um, of, the, um, of the eyepieces. So once you've got that done and that's how you do it, it's just by simply doing this opening and closing, when it's not in the center, you're going to get two images every time. You're going to get like looking through two separate binoculars. Once you've got your eye, your pupils lined up and they're in the center where they should be, then you're going to see just one circle that you're looking at. So it's just like, it's like taking one eye, looking down a tube. You're just going to see a circle on the end. When you've got that done, then you know you've got your, um, your pupil distance all set on your binoculars. The next thing you're going to do, of course, then is just look through and then on the top of your binocular, let me just show you that. You're going to have what you spin back and forth, which is your focuser. And when you move that back and forth, basically, you're just taking your, your back eye pieces and you're moving them back and forth to the front ones, finding a focal point so you can see. If you've got that done and you can see both uh, out of both eyes clearly, then that's all you have to do. Then you don't have to do any more adjustments on your binoculars unless you're sharing them with somebody else. And they may have to adjust the, uh, the balance for their eyes or focus for their eyes. However, oh, also one other important point I almost forgot to mention. On the back of the binoculars, there, um, of course, it has these, these cups. What these cups are for, and this could be another reason why people aren't seeing well enough. If you're wearing glasses, then there's a certain distance that you need to be away from the actual eyepiece. If you do wear glasses, if you have the types that Mike and I have, you just take these little cups and you bend them back. They can be a bit of a, if I'm looking, let me just put them around the way that so I can actually do this. There we go. And you just bend them back like that. Once you've got them bent back like that, let me just turn it all the way around so you can see. You can see that this one is perfectly flat and that's where the glass is. So if you're wearing glasses, that's the way they should be. If you're not wearing glasses, then just take that cup and pull it back out. And then that's designed for people who are not wearing glasses. So that's the point behind those cups. So if you're having trouble and you're wearing or not wearing glasses and these things aren't in the right position for either with or without glasses, that's something you might want to consider. 
The other thing to consider, and the one thing that a lot of people aren't sure of how to do, is actually how to balance the focus on both eyes. And it's really, really simple. So what you're going to do first is if you did what we all talked about first, you know, getting your pupils all lined up, focusing it in, but I'm still seeing one uh, eye that's not focused like the other, then what you're going to do is you're going to take one of the caps of your, um, of your binocular and you're going to cover your right eye. You're going to cover that one on, on the right side. Then you're going to take your focuser and you're going to use your left eye and you're going to actually focus it. So once you've got that sharp, dead sharp, nice and beautiful the way you like it, and you can read a license plate or whatever, then you're going to take that cap off that right eye and you're going to put it on the left eye. Then instead of using the focuser on the top, on the back of that right eye, there's actually an adjustment for focus for that eye. It's called a diopter. So then what you're going to do is with the, with the, the left one covered, you're going to diop, you change the diopter until it's nice and focused, really, really crisp and clear. When you've got that done, then remove the cap, look through both eyes, and you should be able to see crystal clear uh, on whatever it is that you're looking at. So, um, so back to Bill's question, I can't seem to get clearness in my binoculars. It can be a number of things. The first thing is to get rid of the double images, make sure that you get your pupils lined up properly with the, with the uh, center of the eyepieces. The second one, of course, is, um, is to make sure that you've got your, your, your binoculars focused, uh, that sort of thing. And then, of course, uh, using the diopter uh, to, uh, to set both eyes independent of each other. And if you're using glasses or if you're not using glasses, make sure you've got those eye cups in the proper position for either one of the uses of the glasses. Other than that, that's uh, that will be the um, the answer to the uh, um, question of the week about uh, binoculars. So I hope that answered your question, Bill. Awesome, Paul. And we got a couple of questions here, actually. Um, so Kim Hayes asking, uh, what kind of binocular holder is that? Oh, okay. So what I'm using here, like when you first get any set of binoculars that are, especially when they get to a relatively large size, you're going to get um, you're going to get a binocular holder or a binocular mount. To be totally frank, most of them are plastic and they twist and they're crap, really. And so they're really not they're really not all that good. So I went out and I actually bought uh, one that's called uh, Firepoint. Just one sec, I'll take those off and I'll show you. So I'll lock it first here. There we go. There, yeah, binoculars just pull right off. Then I'll take it right off the mount. Perhaps. There we go. So this is called uh, uh, by a company called Firepoint. And what this one is, this is actually metal, and it's rigid, rigid, rigid. And all you do is put on your whatever your tripod's mounted base is, put that on the bottom of that, and then you mount it onto your tripod. The nice thing about this too, it also gives you a space to put um, your uh, finder on. So if you're using these for um, astronomical observation, then the, having a finder on there is a really, really nice thing to have, especially when you start getting into higher power binoculars. When you're doing that type of ob observing, of course, trying to hold it in your hand, anybody who's tried that before, you're just seeing a whole bunch of streaky lines because it's pretty darn hard to do. Even if you sit down in the chair and stuff, you still got some shake. So when you use a mount like this, it really solidifies uh, everything that you're looking at. So you can actually stand back without even touching the um, without even touching the um, uh, the binoculars at all, and it works well. So this one's called the Firepoint. I don't have an actual model number, but if you go to any uh, astronomy or any astronomy uh, retailer and and just uh, dial in Firepoint, you'll find this. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, great. Uh, great info here. And, no, uh, I want to shut off speaker mode. <laughs> what's that? Oh. Say oh. head speaker mode. Yep. Let's go back to gallery. There. Yeah. Um, there we sell after, uh, well, Daniel, I think you'll have to, like Paul says, you have to type Firepoint uh, binocular adapter on Google and you'll find uh, some companies. Now, you can also go to astrobicell.com. And at the top of that page, you'll see a whole bunch of links. And those are generally uh, the, the uh, Canadian companies that are Canadian telescope dealers. Uh, there are a couple in Montreal. There's a few in uh, Toronto, one in Toronto, I think. And then uh, Alberta, 
there's a number of them out there. So uh, you can you can try that. Uh, looks good and strong. Yeah, need that for the 15 by 70s, I would say so, for sure. Yeah, yeah Fire, Firepoint makes really good accessories and good quality accessories, no question. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go quickly to a product of the week, and then we're going to come back and talk to Mike again. Um, and the product of the week, uh, you've seen it before, but because I'm starting to get requests, I'm getting, a, actually, I'm getting, I had four of them today. <laughs> And I had uh, 11 this week. People are looking for telescopes for Christmas uh, for their loved ones, uh, be it a, you know, an adult, uh, husband or wife, or um, a child. And uh, I'm gonna look at one of the ones that is probably really suitable for a child for sure. Let me bring my camera down a bit. And like that. Bring it over this way. And you, who has been following the program has certainly seen this scope before. And it's the Orion uh, Tabletop Reflector Dobsonian Telescope. It's uh, called the Star Blast uh, 4.5. Now, um, what is the 4.5? Well, it's 4.5 inches across here, which is our diameter of our optical tube. And it's a uh, uh, 450 millimeter focal length. Um, so it's an F4 telescope, which means it's gonna give you a, wide, a fairly wide view of, of what you're looking at, the moon, planets, whatever. Um, the, the, the part I'd like about these telescopes now, I know we talked uh, to Mike there about, you know, the tracking idea and how frustrating it can be to not have a tracking mount. Let me make up a little bit there. To not have a tracking mount. Um, my thumb in the way there. <laughs> um, but when you're starting in the hobby, like we probably all started the same way was that we started with a manual mount because it was cheaper and, uh, you know, is what we thought we had to do to get started. And, and it did teach me a number of places in the night sky to look for things. So if I was looking for the Andromeda galaxy, I could pan across, uh, you know, uh, the constellation and find Andromeda, that kind of thing. And that's what this does. It, it, it forces you to learn the night sky. So it's a reflector uh, Dobsonian. So there's the mirror down below. And there's another mirror right here underneath this uh, the spider ring. And that's your secondary mirror. So your primary mirror is at the back, your secondary is at the front. And when you're looking in your eyepiece here, with your focuser, uh, your image is going to be upside down. But in space, there's no upside down. Um, Australia, they should be falling off the planet right now, but they're not great. So, <laughs> so um, no upside down in space. So we don't worry about that part of it. We just want to get uh, an image of the view. Uh, they come, it comes with a nice uh, red dot finder as well. Um, and the scope does two simple things. It's it's rotates this way like a lazy Susan and then up and down this way. So when you want to find something in the sky, it doesn't matter where you are, you're able to turn the scope to whatever location you want and find it. Also comes with a couple of eyepieces. Uh, it's a 16 millimeter and an eight millimeter calendar eyepieces. Um, and it has an adjustment here to tighten the tension. So if you get it set on an object and you want to follow it across the sky easier, then you can, you can tense it up a little bit. Um, any other comments on this, guys? Actually, these we we looked around for scopes for the club, our local club. Um, we had a, a large eight-inch Dobsonian telescope. We had a few small refractors. They weren't really getting out very often. This one doesn't get out very much either, but um, that's not because of that. Um, but we said we wanted a scope that was kind of compact for uh, somebody to use uh, as a beginner. And also compact that if we're bringing the scopes to the meeting and we can take them home again, it's not, it's not, it's not a great big load to carry home. So that was the other factor to them. So uh, we, and we wanted something that was robust that could stand up to some torture a little bit. And uh, I mean, with beginners, uh, you know, things can happen. So uh, the thing about this is it nicely, um, it got it on nicely, it collapses like this, with the one hand it lifts, and away you go. You know, so there's really no weight to it also. And uh, it's a perfect grab and go scope. And, a lot of people have large scopes and they never get out. And it's because it takes so much work to set them up. You know, I look, there's a beautiful moon out there right now. Where, you know, it's just between two clouds right now. So, but I, if I got 60 seconds, I can go out and take a quick peek. Well, I got my scope all set up. You know, it's down by my door or whatever. And I grab a hold of it, set it outside on a small little table and uh, enjoy the moon or enjoy a plant if you've only got a few minutes. You know, that's the advantage of these as well. So they do force you to learn. Uh, the night sky they give you the largest aperture for the least amount of money that's what a dobsonian does for you 
Uh, and they're very simple to operate. There's no mechanics, there's no electronics, there's nothing to worry about except for putting a battery in your finder scope. So that's why I would recommend this for a beginner, uh, adults and children, um, uh, certainly uh, children up to the age of say 14 and under would have a great time with it. Adults, you know, they're going to use it for a while and maybe pass it on to the kids, but it's going to get you started in the hobby. Uh, it's a step up from binoculars. I'll say that. Uh, it's not a go-to telescope, but um, you know, when you get into go-to, you're starting to look around close to a thousand bucks, right? Uh, for anything with any quality. Uh, so under that, this is one of your major options. Now to bring that up, let me share my screen for a second. Um, just going to take a second. Yeah, like you said, Chris, like, yes, you can get like a nice eight inch dub and stuff like that, but it gets awkward after a while to pack up and disassemble and put it back in your car and stuff. And the reason the club looked at going to those is because they're a good scope, very easy to transport, very easy to, you know, grab, like you say, and set up. You can put it on a picnic table or you can build a little tripod and set it on top of that. And it works just as good in both. So, right. You know, it was, it was a good idea for the club to really step down to scope that size as opposed to getting another 8-inch daub or 10-inch daub, right? I think so. So here's one site, uh, La Maison de l'Astronomie. They're in uh, Montreal. Um, there are two telescope stores in Montreal. I didn't check the other one out, but I'm, I think they carry them as well. But they've got it listed here for $349.95. So that's uh, plus taxes and shipping. So uh, you're looking at, you know, 500 bucks probably time you get it landed. Um, the thing about these, though, is too, is that they uh, they are uh, high, they have a high resale value because they are a good little scope. They're hard to find, uh, used, and when they are used, uh, they still sell for approximately the same price. The ones I found around, anyway. So, uh, so they keep their value. And if you, I mean, with a telescope like that, it's it's not being moved around a whole lot. It's just kind of sitting in one spot. So telescopes don't get treated roughly like say. Uh, a sled with or you know a bike or whatever right so um they tend to keep their value longer so there's uh there's the information about it it's actually on that page um and also I'm gonna bring up another one here uh where is it uh, just a second it's down here and it's uh this seven this one here okay so um this is another uh, page uh, eyes on the sky with david fuller i followed david there for a little while um he's uh, he's got some great information on his website he does a lot of uh, YouTube instructional videos, tutorials. And uh, what I what kind of interested me here was that he has free plans on how to build a simple, easy to build tripod from two by fours, plywood and some basic hardware. There it is. So there's your little four and a half inch dog sitting on your own tripod. Yeah, we um, don't see that, Chris. Oh, you don't see it? Oh, sorry. Hang on. Um, one second. Why are you not seeing it? Oh, hang on. Let's try this again. There you go. There we go. Okay, there we go. So Eyes in the Sky from David Fuller. Um, and uh, he has a two by four tripod available, which is this one right here. So it's it's ideal for this uh, little tabletop daub or any of these little tabletop daubs. Um, you can build it to your own height, like the height that you would want it at. Um, it's actually completely collapsible. This centered uh, piece here uh, twists to, uh, to the right or left and it allows the legs actually to collapse. So he's got even got a list of materials here and uh, there's where he starts and works his way down through. He's got a, a bolt all the way down through the center that holds this uh, stabilizer bar and slots in it for eyepieces. So did a nice job on it. Hinges here on the bottom. So all the steps are right there. Um, and it's a, it's a great little uh, tripod our table mount uh, for this little tabletop dob. I was looking for one myself because I said, what are you going to you know, do with this thing when you take it outside? You're going to find a table, but you're never going to find the table exactly at the right height for you. So are you going to be sitting, standing, whatever, right? So uh, this one here, you can actually uh, build to the height that you want. So I thought that was pretty cool. So that's my product of the week suggestion. Um, again, uh, tabletop uh, star glass 4.5. It's called an Orion 4.5 star glass telescope. Uh, Sony and tabletop uh, telescope. I noticed on that the David Fuller um, video on the very top of it, there's actually PDF of the plans. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. So okay. that's uh, yeah. So if somebody wants to take a take a crack and build one. There you go. You got the plans. It all works. So. Yeah. Okay, that's my suggestion. Uh, let's see. Uh, fell into an eight-inch job and ended up having to sell just too much equipment. Janice says, yeah. 
um, that can be Janus. Like an eight inch dog is, is a pretty big scope and it's transporting it too can be a little bit, uh, can be a little bit uh, difficult. If you have it in your backyard, okay, it's that tabletop collapsible, um, not that one. It's, but I mean, it's only, it's less than two feet long, I guess. So it's pretty light, pretty easy to move around. Well, the 114 behind you is collapsible. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, the 114 back there is, yes. Well, that's 130 actually. Oh, that's okay. Another good scope. Yeah. Now that one has a, has a helical focuser on it. So those helical focusers are a little bit, a bit different to uh, to get focused properly. Uh, seeing got people on there take Teflon tape and wrap around the threads to try to make them tight. But anyway, that's another option. Okay, um, let's move on from there then. I think we get all the all the questions answered. No other question. Yeah. Yep. Good. Um, okay, from there we're going to go to a vinyl bed. No, oh, actually, let's uh, let's go to a vinyl bed and we're going to come back and talk to Mike. Mike, you're getting off pretty pretty clear here, but <laughs> <laughs> where is screen one? Alrighty. All righty, binocular target of the week this week by Bino Bud is following Paul. Everybody's going to get their binoculars out now because they know how to use them properly. And you're going to go out tonight and you're going to find the Christmas tree cluster because it's that time of year. We're <laughs> on our way and it's coming and it's going to cost us a whole bunch of money on things that we don't want to spend money on, but we do. So the Christmas tree cluster was named for its triangular shape formed by a cluster of very young stars that look like a tree in visible light, believe it or not. The, that's the Christmas tree cluster. And the Cone Nebula, they were both discovered by William Herschel. He discovered the cluster in 1784 and the Nebula in 1785. So NGC 2264 is a large, bright cluster, easily visible in binoculars. And it consists of about 80 stars from an eighth magnitude, and it spans about half a degree across. So it's actually pretty big. Where do I find it in the sky? Well, because it's close to Orion, you're going to get up at midnight. I'm not going to be one of these people that you know does astronomy between six and nine. You got to get out there on a clear night, no less. Orient yourself at midnight, 120 degrees east southeast. Look up, you'll see Orion, and you'll see uh, what is it called, Montessero, and it's right in between the two. If you come down, say from halfway up his club down to the top star in Montessero, it's right there. It is that bright cluster right in this area right here. Or you look and there's Gemini coming down. You take the two bottom feet of Gemini and come straight down and just a little bit to the right and you'll hit it. It's not, not a hard target to see. You'll know when you're on it. it. It lights up pretty good. What does that look like? Well, it actually, in binoculars, it's going to be the other way around. But in a telescope, it's right side up and it kind of looks like a Christmas tree with the stars being all the balls hanging off it. So it looks pretty cool. That's the name, Christmas tree. 10 by 50 binoculars is a good size object. You can see it kind of, it's upside down in binoculars, but when you're using a telescope, it flips upside right. But you can still make out that it's a tree and use your imagination because 90% of astronomy is imagination. My famous quote, compared to the full moon, well bigger than the full moon for the whole cluster. So you'll be able to see it. If you can find a full moon with a pair of binoculars, you'll be able to find this cluster if you're looking in the right area. And bad joke of the week, how many aerospace engineers does it take to change a light bulb? None. It doesn't take a rocket scientist, you know. <laughs> that was a bad joke of the week. <laughs> that was good or target of the week by Bud. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Another great one. They're all great. Spinal bird. Yeah, they're all, they're all great. <laughs> um, I did have a question here. What are your opinions on the new smart telescopes on the market, such as the Stellina, the Sarah, and others? Uh, do they work and are they worth it? You know, um, seem very reasonable as far as cost goes, Daniel says. So, Daniel, I, uh, I think you're Daniel. Um, you can go to uh, my page. Our, our YouTube channel uh, from a couple of weeks ago, uh, Haley Craswell was on the show. 
Um, she's a very young astronomer, but uh, has got a, the Sea Star 50, and which is similar to the uh, to the other two models that you mentioned. And uh, they're uh, both of the family is very happy with it, as far as I can understand. Uh, they're very pleased with the results. I actually got a few images tonight, I think, from that from Joey Croswell sent in. Um, anyway, um, she does a nice little video on on uh, how to set it up the whole bit, and uh, she's having a great time with it. So yeah, I would recommend that type of telescope as well. Smart ones. They fit right into today's one-handed world where you get your phone in your other hand. That's the idea. Yeah, <laughs> there's really no eyepiece with them. They're uh, they're you know it's it's an app on your phone that you're that you're looking at the image with. And I mean, there, you know, there are many who you know looking at. I love to look at something live through an eyepiece. I don't like to look at it on a phone myself necessarily. I I look at computers most of the day, so I'm not interested in seeing what it, my hobby, you know, all over a computer, but. I would rather see it live with the photons landing on my own eyeball, but I'm old school that way. Uh, you know, that's why I'm still using, still using Dobbs. <laughs> but um, you know, it, it is it is an easier way to get into the hobby, and it's and it's, it can be a very satisfying part of the hobby as well. To start stacking images and and seeing the results. If, if any one of us look at the Andromeda Galaxy, it's just a big blob. You know, it looks like a cloud. People are. You tell people that's probably the most disappointing thing you can show people in the telescope. <laughs> Come on, have a look at the Andromeda Galaxy. Oh, great. And then they look in and they see this big blob. They're looking for it. They don't see it. <laughs> no, it's right in front of you. It's that little, little waxy paper kind of piece there in front of you. Uh, but with these uh, new uh, smart telescopes, they're stacking images and they're coming up with a whole better view. You know, So even yeah. that's... I, guess. I think the biggest thing from that, Chris, is the fact that if they're not for observing, they're for taking pictures. Mm. So uh, once you understand that, it's not something you can go out there and look in a field and everybody have a look through an eyepiece. Mm. That's not that's not what the design of those are. But when you do take pictures of things, which is what they'll do, and they'll do it for you automatically, it'll give you a much more um, pleasing look at something because what you see behind me on my screen is a is something that would look like a big gray smear when you look at it. But with these uh, little devices that you're bringing up and talking about, you'll actually be able to see things like this in color. So, uh, and they're very simple to use and very simple to operate. So um, if it's something that, um, you know, that, you know, you're not going to be observing, but you're going to be taking pictures, this is absolutely a wonderful way to get started. Yeah. Mike Thorne, do you do any photography at all with yours, astrophotography or no? Not at all. Yeah. You're I more... have no interest in astrophotography. Yeah. Well, that's, that's like me. I share these guys' pictures. Oh, mostly that guy. <laughs> I let him do the 10 or 15 hours work and I share it. Wow. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All yeah. right. Um, so, Mike, where where's your favorite observing? Like, where do you like to observe from the, the, the most? Either my backyard or the St. Rest Beach are my two most popular spots. So if you had your druthers, where where would you like to where would you observe the backyard or or down at the beach? Um, I kind of prefer the beach for outreach. I like sharing the views with other people, and it's just more fun. Yeah, the spring nights when you're getting uh, before the before the uh, we get to the point where the sky gets dark so late. I mean, in the early spring and fall. Those are great times to be out doing the outreach because people are, mm. are still out enjoying the beach and stuff and you get opportunity to show them the planets and the moon and, and on from there. So me as well. I mean, I'm a sidewalk astronomy kind of guy, I guess, but I've always been. But yeah, for me, it's crowds. And, and you, you see something nice in your backyard, who are you sharing it with? Right? Yeah, no. I, the, <laughs> not the wife. <laughs> no. I, I guess the dogs are a little short to get up there and look at the eyepiece, are they? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what that stool's for, Paul. I showed you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to our Rosanna's fun fact. We're getting a little bit late in the show here. Paul, are uh, you up for a Rosanna fun fact? I think so. Okay, let me just see if I can remember how to do all this shorter stuff. I just share my screen. Okay, and this is this week's. Oh, we don't hear your song, Paul. Uh, oh, you know why? Uh, I know why. Just give me a sec. Okay, Sorry about that, folks. I know exactly what I didn't do. Uh, share screen. 
and then share sound. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, we'll try that one more time. I'll go back to sharing my screen. And now this is this week's. Yay, welcome back, Rosanna, for another absolutely wonderful fun fact that she is going to share with us again. So let's get right into it. So um, this week, Rosanna writes, um, hi, Paul, did you ever have a little tag along sibling or friend when you were growing up? I was the tag along little sister, having both an older brother and an older sister. Tag alongs are not always appreciated, but sometimes they provide surprises. Now, let me just get rid of this photo so I can get the other one up here. Hang on one second. As Mike would say, hang on to your pickle. <laughs> Hold your back. All right, so here we are. So on November the 1st, uh, the Lucy mission discovered a set of tag along touching asteroids in orbit around the asteroid. I, I'm going to say Dinkinish because at the end it'll make sense. There are among, they are among the first ever moonlets seen up close and are the one, uh, the only ones ever observed orbiting another asteroid. This image was taken at 1 p.m. Uh, November the 1st at 2.20, no, November the 1st, 2023, about six minutes after closest approach from a range of approximately 1,630 kilometers or a little over a thousand miles. From this perspective, the satellite is revealed to be a uh, contact binary. So the Lucy mission, uh, the Lucy mission team started to suspect that uh, Dinkinish may have a satellite after noticing regular repeating changes in its brightness as the spacecraft approached. This was confirmed when Lucy took its first close-up look at its target. And uh, in the first images sent back from the flyby, it looked like a single tiny asteroid, but it was orbit, uh, that, sorry, orbit that around Dickenish. Only when the team saw additional images captured in the minutes around the encounter, did they notice the second moonlit? So the first frames were taken about 13 seconds apart. The apparent motion of the asteroids is due to the changing perspective of the camera as the spacecraft flew past, rather than the satellite's orbit around the main asteroid itself. Lucy is on its way to visit seven Trojan asteroids. The flyby of the was to be was to test the spacecraft's anonymous tracking capabilities. The terminal tracking system it's a pair of cameras. There we go. Um, there we go. A pair of cameras that images targets as Lucy approaches, providing detailed position data that allow the spacecraft's instruments to um, autonomously determine when to start collecting their scientific data and allow them to stay locked on their target during the entire flyby. Now, that's quite a wow for technology. Now, this is an illustration of Lucy tracking a Dinkinich. Now it's not the scale, but it just gives you an idea of how as, as the as Lucy flies past it, as you can see the different angles that it looks at it. So you can see why it would be certainly easy to see something one minute and not so much the next. So because Dinkinich is much smaller than any of Lucy's other targets, the tracking system had to perform an even more difficult task than uh, it will during its main mission, and it succeeded. The spacecraft made its flyby at a distance of only 425 kilometers or 264 miles from the asteroid. Now, here is one of the first shots that does not yet reveal the second tag along moonlit. That's a pretty detailed shot. That's pretty awesome, really. So the asteroid Dickenish and its unexpected small satellite as captured by the Lucy Long Range uh, Reconnaissance Imager uh, or otherwise known as the LLORR, <laughs> range uh, from a range of approximately 270 miles from its perspective. Now, Lucy's expected flight plan through the universe is pretty exciting. There will be another test of the terminal tracking. Whoops, sorry, lost my, I lost my page. One sec. Whoop. Uh, one sec here, folks. I lost where I was at. I turned off my page. 
Okay, yeah, so there we go. Now let me just find that again. There we go. So Lucy's expected flight plan through universe is pretty exciting. There will be another test of the terminal tracking system in 2025 uh, on, on a main belt asteroid, Donald Johnson. Perhaps that test will also reveal another surprising tag along. Then Lucy is off to the Jupiter Trojan asteroid, reaching the first one in 2027. The new contact binaries have yet to be named, perhaps Dinky 1 and Dinky 2, or Dumpling 1 or 2, or even Kermit and Miss Piggy. <laughs> the asteroid Dinkinish is named after the Ethiopian name for the Lucy fossil. The Amharic word for Dinkinish means you are wonderful. The Lucy mission is named after a fossilized skeleton that helps scientists learn where humans fit into the evolutionary chain of life. The asteroid Donald Johnson is named after a paleontologist who co-discovered the Lucy fossil. Just like, uh, just like its ancestral namesake, Lucy aims to give us more complete picture of our space origin story. Hey, Kirby, Deaconish, huh? <laughs> and that's this week's. That's fun fact. <laughs> oh, you're doing great, Miss Piggy. That's oh, great. my gosh. Well, again, it's, you're wonderful. So that's what she's saying to Kermit. Hey, Kermit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where she gets them, but I tell you. Keep them covered. Not copyrated with that. With so that entertaining. That's great. Thanks, Rosanna. Awesome. Thank you, Rosanna. Pretty cool to have a couple of moons like that. Yeah. All right. Um, let's go from there to uh, Celestial Wonder of the Week. We're getting a little bit late, I know, so I want to bring that one up next, and then uh, we're going to get into some uh, quick photos. We only got a, oh, about a dozen photos here to share, so let me get our Celestial Wonder of the Week up. Uh, Hang on. And we're going to go share screen. It should be screen four, this one, I guess. Okay. And I think that's up. Yep. And uh, this week, wonder of the week. And it's going to be uh, the Dance of the Galilean Moons. Uh, we've talked about this before and on other occasions. Um, you can see here all these things in blue are all uh, Galilean moons uh, that uh, are passing in front of or behind or dragging their shadows across uh, the planet Jupiter. And it seems to be happening quite a bit around uh, this time of year. Um, and we're going to go through just a few of them here that are kind of neat for this week. So... If we start out with a Jupiter's moon Isle, as it as the moon and its shadow traverse across the great planet tomorrow evening. Uh, now Io's transit begins at 2149 and it ends at 2358 Atlantic time. Now its shadow begins its journey across the planet at 2216 and the shadow actually ends at 2426. So a couple hours for uh, Io's shadow to drag across the planet. Tiny little moon, great big planet. Uh, on Tuesday evening now, uh, there's three events taking place. So First, Europa's shadow will egress the planet at 1803. There's a, there it is there. So we don't get to see it coming onto the planet uh, because it's still bright, still, still daylight. Um, but we get to see it uh, leaving the planet. Um, and then uh, Io will disappear behind Jupiter. This is called an occultation disappearance. If I got that right, hopefully I do. Uh, so it'll disappear behind Jupiter. So you'll watch it here and all of a sudden, blip, gets out of the way. And then at 1906, and then uh, reappear from its shadow at 24, um, uh, 2145 Atlantic time, which is called an eclipse reappearance. So Jupiter's shadow is cast out into space. It pops out from the shadow. Um, also on Tuesday evening, watch for a little aisle once again, or sorry, that's supposed to be uh, Thursday evening, uh, as it transits a great planet and drags its shadow behind it. Um, the transit begins in daylight, but we can witness both the transit egress at 1824 and the shadow egress at 1855. And finally, we'll get to witness the entire event uh, when Jupiter's largest moon, Ganymede, uh, transits across the planet beginning from 20 uh, to 2120. There it is right there, just across the bottom of the planet, uh, with its shadow following, it looks fairly big, uh, from 2206 to 2347 Atlantic time. 
Yeah. Um, so watch the dance of the Galilean moons all week. It's kind of like a mini solar system in action without the solar part. <laughs> uh, get that information from here. We can go to sjastronomy.ca or raskinb.ca. You see this calendar up uh, uh, put out every month by Kurt Nason. Does a great job in the calendar. Actually, it's a month and a half or so. And then uh, you can also find that some of the information here from Lisa's Look Up Astronomy and More. So find Lisa Fanning at Lisa's Look Up. Find her at Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Mastodon, and Facebook. And Lisa puts up the event uh, for the for the, uh, the celestial event, the date of the celestial event, the peak times when it's available, and what you need for seeing tools, naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. So that is this week's... And we stop sharing. How's that? Good. There, we'll stop now. There you are. Okay, we're back. Hi. Right. Now, quickly, some photos. I'm up again, I guess. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah I am up again. Hang on. Here's photos. Uh, let me share it. Uh, just a few photos to share this week. Let me bring up the share screen again. We're going to go with. Screen number three. Okay, here we go with photos. Visible there, okay? There it is. Okay, so Joey Croswell sends this one. He says, hi, Chris. Uh, last week while Haley was shooting the Orion Nebula, Diane was shooting the beautiful Aurora, and I was busy imaging as well. Now, here's what I captured. He said, first, the California Nebula, NGC 1499, two hours and 15 minutes of exposure time. That's 45 images at 180 seconds each. Beautiful capture. Yes, very nice. Well done. Very nice. And from there, we're going to go to uh, the second one here. Is He says, uh, is images of two beautiful deep space objects in one. Uh, first is a flaming star nebula in the constellation of Auriga. And then at the bottom is the Tadpoles Nebula, about uh, four hours exposure time. That's 90 images at 180 seconds each. Well, another great shot. Mm, beautiful. Well yeah, done. Great work. Nebulosity, my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Well, Especially awesome job. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Joey, for those. Um, Jason Dane sent this one in. Jason was with us, of course, last week. Uh, hi there, he says, here's one shot. Here's one I shot over the last two nights. The check mark shape is LBN 534. And the clouds of dust at the bottom are a number of other bright nebula in the LBN 55X and 56X series. Wow, nice. Wow, very nice. Where yeah. that, that must be similar to the witch head as far as uh, comp composition goes, I would guess. Hmm. Nice. Did it say how many hours? Uh, no, he didn't give you the time. Okay. Just said, said he shot it over the last two nights, so. Yeah. Fair enough. He puts awesome. in lots and lots of hours to be able to reveal all that. Mm. That faint cloud. That's amazing. Yeah. Check mark. Cool. Thanks, Jason. I'm going to go from there to Brad Perry's shot here. Look at this one. Oh, nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. He said, just wanted to share this photo I got on Thursday night of the Crescent Moon over Fredericton City Hall. He said, this one was a rare win in terms of correct planning and cloud cooperation. I bet. Awesome. Wow. Very nice. Yeah. Very well done, Brad. Thanks for that. Okay, um, that will be entered in the moon contest too. So, uh, David Hoskins, I managed to capture these images of Jupiter, he says, with the great red spot uh, transiting just before the clouds rolled in. Um, seeing was average at best, he says. Uh, equipment was a Celestron 8 SET, a ZWO ASI 224MC camera uh, with without L or without R, um, GSO 2.5 Barlow, and Skywatcher EQ6R mount. Well done. There's some things, big red spot. Yeah, so, very nice. They're, they're hard to capture. And days. to find it with no clouds. <laughs> clouds yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's another treat. Wow. Thanks very much, David. Okay, we got this one also from uh, David. It's uh, uh, his uh, 30, single 30 second exposure of Comet 12P Ponds Brooks. Now, they've been talking about Ponds Brooks because it's getting these kind of like devil horns coming off of it. And it happened yeah. before, and it's. Uh, it's been explosive in material. Some of the material has been injected uh, wildly from the, the comet. So they were seeing these uh, kind of like devil horns popping out on it. So 
Thanks for that, David. Uh, this one's from uh, David Samard. Uh, last night, one of the rare nights, he said to take in uh, take some pictures in this M33 60 seconds at gain of 180, win two and 60 pictures. It was fun to be inside the house and uh, a bit cold, <laughs> in, the, in the rig a bit cold. <laughs> yeah. Fun to be in the house. Getting there. Getting there, Get there, David. Hit yeah. the core of that yeah. very well. Yeah. yeah. Done, Beautiful. Matthew DePrey's capture here. M45, the Pleiades, of course. Oh, uh, never gets old, eh? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. An hour and 44 minutes total exposure time using two minute sub exposures and no filters. So I took this with my Celestron nine and a quarter Hyperstar and ASI 2600 MC Pro, all controlled with ASI Air. I stacked it in Deep Sky Stacker and proceeded, uh, processed it in Serial. Well That's done. Fair. Fair. Gorgeous. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. I'm going to go on to Carol Bean here. Her shots, uh, some photos of the Crescent Moon from tonight, uh, the other night, I guess, uh, November 16th from St. Stephen. So well done. Yes. He sets up that shot nicely. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks, wow. Carol. Okay, one final one. I'm going to come back. I got to come back. First of all, stop sharing. And I got to minimize this one because it's going to pop up on a different screen for me, but I got one more to share and I just got to open it up here. And I'm going to stop it for a second. So this one comes from uh, Diane Croswell. I'm just going to enlarge it and I'll go back to share screen. And it should be about screen four, which is here. Okay. So this one comes from Diane. Um, hang on a second. Here it is. So uh, time lapse. Uh, Diane says, hey, guys, I finally got a chance to do a time lapse of the Northern Lights uh, shot over a period of 45 minutes on Sunday, November the 12th, uh, between 11 and 11.45 p.m. in La Tete, down around St. George. Um, this It's amazing to see how it moves and changes color. There you go. Never. Nice yeah, grab. Play, play, play it again. Yeah, you bet. Very nice capture. Oh, hang on. Bring it back here the first. I should bring it here. Let's try again. No, it's nice. It's locking up. That's frozen up. Okay. It does that. Nice, um, nice. You, uh, Windows Media Player does that. I'm going to stop share. No, one second. I'll just bring yeah, it back. It's, time. Um, it's almost like being there when you see those time lapses because they, once this guy gets busy, they do tend to move. They do. Yep. Yeah. Like when we That's were funny. Out, we were out shooting the same night and got none of that. And yet down there, they, they got that. That was incredible. Yeah. And it stopped again. Hmm. You know what it is? It's uh, I'm moving my mouse on the screen. It doesn't like that with uh, Windows Media Player. They don't have Windows Media Player regular anymore. It's a legacy one, so uh, it just doesn't want to play. Anyway, I want to thank you that for yeah. So uh, what did I also I want to do? I want to share this picture. I guess one second. <laughs> Too many screens. Okay. So if you have uh, images you'd like to share, we love getting them. As you can see, uh, send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. And we'd love to get them on our next program. Very, very quickly, I'm going to talk about something else. Um, and it's just this uh, little bit here. Let me bring it up in the right spot. Okay, so it's uh, four again. Very quickly, just a... Quick note again on the uh, newest to shoot the moon contest I have running right now. Um, so uh, how to enter adults, take a new picture of the moon with any device. All entries are accepted. There's no judging at all. Uh, send your entries into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. And for kids under 12, draw a picture of what you might see if you looked through a telescope. Now it can be a planet, a moon, an alien, or whatever your favorite space thing happens to be. Have your parents take a picture of your drawing and then send that into the same address, astronomybythebay at gmail.com. Remember, make sure that your parents include your age so that the prizes that come out are age appropriate. So there's 20 prizes to be won. Here they all are, right here. Uh, for the adults, a copy of the book, Firefly Night Sky Atlas, uh, two copies of the book, Astronomy, A Definitive Guide, two copies of the book, 50 Things to See on the Moon by local author John Reed. And then from there, I have uh, seven 500 piece space puzzles and an educational space book, two copies of my space uh, place fact pack, uh, two copies of the what and how and why about space, uh, two copies of the glow in the dark constellation books, 
and two copies of the space book with over 50 hidden flaps to open up. They're always fun. All prizes must have arrangement to be picked up here in St. John. There is no shipping with these. The shipping would cost more than the prizes. So get out there and have fun shooting and enjoying the moon. And for the children, I will be changing my Facebook cover page each day with a new entry. So send them in and I will be happy to um, do them. So that's it. That's our contest. I first saw the picture. I thought, it was, oh, great. There's 10 boxes of Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He likes our candy. <laughs> you like, uh, <laughs> okay, so just give me a second here. I'll uh, I'll get our uh, ending of our program ready to go. And I think we're just about there. Okay, I've got too many things going on here. Mike, so that's our show for thanks. this evening. <laughs> uh, we hope you enjoyed the program tonight. Special thanks to our guest Mike Thorne for joining us this evening. Thanks, Mike, for sharing your program with us. Hope you can come back and join us in the future. We'll see you at the beach too. Uh, yeah. Thanks as well goes to out to Rosanna, of course, for her fabulous fun fact segments. Thank you, Rosanna. Always a pleasure. Remember, too, we do love getting your uh, or sharing your photos. So please send them in to uh, astronomybythebay at gmail.com and we'll be happy to share them on our next broadcast. Now, special thanks again to our friends out at Rogers for joining us again this evening. So until next week, uh, wishing all of you uh, clear skies. And as we like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Point it up. Yep. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Wigsman.